Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Here in a few moments, we'll continue our study through the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 8, verse 33. Um, we do our best to do the study every Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. We stream to both our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. And both of those, wrong button, wrong button again. Well, there you go, that'll work. <clears throat> a little rusty here still. Anyway, Truth Factor Live. You'll see, you'll find them both on YouTube as well as Facebook. And you can also email us in the questions at truthfactorlive.com. Let's see, we've got several who have uh, joined us here today. Let me get back over to our main group. There we go. Um, Jimmy has joined us, Danielle and Jerry. There may be others as well. If this is your first time, be sure to kind of let us know if you don't mind. Say, hey, I'm Bob from Minnesota or wherever. I uh, would love to be able to um, hear from you. We do have a chat. You can participate in the study via the chat section um, of the uh, YouTube channel or the comment section connected on to this video on Facebook. And so we'd love to hear what you have to say about these things. All right, <clears throat> Brian, welcome back. <clears throat> welcome back, yeah. All right, and we're missing Paul today as well as Brendan and Bob. They are unable to um, join us today. So hopefully we'll be able to see them again uh, next week or two. So let's go ahead and pick up our reading in the section here of John chapter 8. And Brian, if you would read verses 31 through 36, please. Uh, reading out the New King James, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will make us free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not about abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay. So, Brian, in this chapter so far, we've seen several conversations that he's been having that's kind of, um, you know, agitated some, some people and everything through the course of this. But you made an interesting point before the study, you know, kind of if you want to elaborate on it, um, a particular point that John brings out in his narrative in verse 31. Yeah, I've always found it fascinating that uh, the Bible is very specific, uh, potentially linking to verse 30 as well, that these this conversation is with a group of Jews who believe Jesus. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I find it interesting, the language of verse 30 says to believe in him, and verse 31 says to believe him. And of course, you know, we live in a time where there's a, a powerful doctrine that says, you know, all you need to do is believe Jesus or believe in Jesus. Um, yet... This conversation is with a group of people that by the end of this chapter are going to be trying to kill Jesus. Uh, so even if they believe Jesus, they're not on Jesus' side. Indeed, Jesus will say in the next verse, verse 37, you you want to kill me. Um, so I've always found that fascinating that uh, these aren't people that say, we don't think Jesus is real. We don't think he's legitimate. And you have to wonder if that might not be the language of, you know, one of the things in the book of John where you have a lot of the background conversations, whether it's Nicodemus talking to the council or, you know, whenever uh, Caiaphas is talking to the council later in chapter 12, um, you get a lot of the background conversation. And it's not a conversation where they say, hey, Jesus is a false teacher. Or he's not telling the truth. It's more of, hey, what are the consequences going to be if Jesus continues on? Uh, it really makes you wonder that perhaps these are people that say, well, I, you know, he really is a prophet. We still need to kill him. I've, I've always found this just fascinating. <clears throat> well, Tom, Tom, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you will. Well, you know, uh, and, and we have a private chat and I'm just throwing something in here. I, I've always looked at this and, and, and I, I'm sure you don't uh, disagree with me that more than likely this is a mixed audience, mm. uh, uh, spiritually, spiritually mixed audience. You have those who are his disciples and you have his outright enemies those who do not believe he's the prophet or whatever. And, and I think that actually comes out in the statements that are made a little later on. But then we also have, uh, if, if you can use the term, the fence straddlers. And, 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 and like I said, that's a good point you bring up from verse the, the 31. 
when you look at it, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And, and of course, that's emphasizing that, you know, there are some calling themselves disciples, but are you really a disciple? And, and that applies to us. So. Well, how would you contrast this? And I'm going to bring it up with the um, of John chapter 12, verse 42 where the statement is, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest there should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Do you think that John's comment here about these individuals who believed in him, would it be the same type of belief or maybe something a little bit different? Yeah. Now, are you talking about the John 12 or the John 8 or both John, of them? Well, John 12, 42 he talks yeah. about the rulers who believed in Jesus, yeah. but did not confess him. Comparing, do you think it'd be the same type of belief as we're looking at here? In other words, they accepted what he said to be true, probably thought he was a prophet, maybe even thought he was a son of God, depending on their level of belief. But yet they were quickly upset. Like what we're talking about there, uh, what we're kind of leading into the way the conversation goes in chapter eight. Over here, their belief wasn't strong enough for them to follow him because they liked the praise of men more than the praise of God. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what I see in that is, uh, I again, I, I see the idea of a divided assembly uh, in the same way. When I say divided in this case, this case you have those that are aggressive and strong, and you have those that they believe in him, but they're weak. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, weak from the standpoint of um, uh, not willing to stand up for him. So, so um, they, I, I think they fully believe in him, who he is. <clears throat> They're just too weak to stand up and defend him. And, and I, I, and I think we see that today. You know, you know, even within a congregation, within a congregation, you have those that are, you have those that are stronger and more outspoken. And, and you have those that will never, that will never speak up in any circumstance. And, and some do it for various reasons, you know, so some do it, some do it out of humility, but, but other, others do it out of timidity, which uh, there's obviously a different, you know, just like there's a difference between meek and weak, uh, you know, you know, from those standpoints. And, and I, I, I see, especially in the John 12, I, I see the idea of they're just not strong enough to stand up for him. I yeah. I think in the case of John 8, I, th I think you got a mix. I, okay. I, I think you have some genuine disciples. I think you have some fence straddlers uh, that are still processing. And, and, and I'll tell you right now in the John 12, and let me give you an example of that, which comes as Nicodemus you know, described as a secret disciple. He was clearly a disciple of Jesus, but he wasn't fully committed at first, but there <laughs> did come a quote unquote straw that broke the camel's back where he said no more. And I believe that to be true of Joseph of Arimathea, as well as Nicodemus. And, and, and I, I think you have levels of that in John eight. And I think maybe even in John 12, you have some level of that. Some will reach beyond the point where they say, you know, that's it. Yeah. And some will just choose to wallow, waller in the mediocrity and just never stand up because it's who they are. Okay. All right. Um, Brian, any, any thoughts on that comparison? No, I think, I think Tom made some excellent points. Okay. It does tell us, and I think y'all have already touched on this, that the word belief is not always be understood as at the same level. Um, cause Jesus, Jesus kind of will go on to say in John 12, this is a paraphrase. Basically, if you really did believe in me, then you would believe in him who sent me, you know? Um, yeah. but, um, okay. Well, and, so let, and one thing, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I'll add one no, more thought just to say, you know, what's interesting in this chapter, yeah. uh, is we're introduced to this word abide, which becomes, gets used a lot in the book of John. Um, I was, I was just double checking, uh, did, did a quick word search. It's used more in the book of John than, you know, any of the other gospels combined. Um, and we think more of the abide in me, abide in my word, but mm -hmm. here he introduces the idea of if you abide in my word, you're my disciples. 
And then in John chapter 15, he'll say, hey, if you abide in me, then what you're doing is you're keeping my commandments. And uh, I think it's interesting because, again, believing in Jesus and abiding in Jesus may not necessarily be the same thing. And that's, that's again, yeah. what I think is really uh, one of the takeaways could be here is that, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, he's a really, you know, important person or, you know, like, like, like Nicodemus says, you know, in John 3, he says, starts off by saying, hey, we know, you know, this, you must be something special, you know, because, you know, what you're doing is, is unique. Um, right. Well, we may know that, but we're not going to abide in you. You know, we're not, we're not, you know, and I, and I say at that point, even Nicodemus is kind of, you know, um, you know, Tom talks about Finstrattlers. I think Nicodemus would be a, a good example of that in the sense that, you know, and, and I, and I agree with Tom, it really seems like it's at, at Jesus's death that he finally makes a, a, a declarative uh, action by taking the body of Jesus, defiling himself for the Passover, so to speak. And, uh, you know, publicly, you know, showing care for the body of Christ um, is a pretty pronounced thing. But the whole point is that here, let's, let's grab that word abide here that he uses here in verse 31. He uses mm -hmm. it again <clears throat> here. Um, um, well, I thought he used it again here. Maybe I'm just not seeing it. Um, but you know that this, you know, that to to dwell in Christ and for Christ to dwell in us is about yeah. obedience, not just believing in Him. Exactly, as a, it's right up there with fellowship. You know, if you kind of comp, comp, and John uses both terms in his fir, uh, first John, his first letter. A quick comment <clears throat> from Jerry. He says, um, John twelve forty three says why the rulers were not vocal in their belief in Jesus, and that's right. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And then Danielle points out, going back to what Tom was saying there, um, well, in Revelation, one of the things mentioned is cowardliness that will not inherit eternal life. That's right. That is exactly right. Okay. All right. Appreciate the thoughts and comments. Let's step back into the text here. Um, <clears throat> picking up there with verse 33 there. So when, so Jesus, so Jesus says to them, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Can I look at that again there? This kind of triggered them for a moment. Okay. Now it, you and I both know the history of the children of Israel. They knew the history. They had been uh, slaves in Egypt during the time period of the judges. They were enslaved different times. Then they were carried off to Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And during the Antiochus Epiphanes, they were just on the verge of losing it all and becoming slaves, if not destroyed all over again. But yet, in their arrogance, they say, we're Abraham's descendants and we've never been in bondage to anyone. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't it, isn't it ironic that as they say that they're in Rome, you know, uh, they're subject to Rome. Yeah. And I got to deal with this phone, whatever. So I'll be back. Oh, great. But that's right. Even then, maybe not slaves to the same level they were in Egypt, but still. So yeah. anyway, yeah, they say, I, yeah. no, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. I said, they, and he, they ask him, how can you say you will be made free? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about what his answer there, Brian, while Tom had to take the call there. Um, well, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yep. No, no, I was just going to say it's, it's, an, it's an important idea. We see it again mm -hmm. in Romans chapter 6 where we are declared that the concept mm -hmm. is you are owned by whatever it is that uh, you serve. Um, uh, one of the things I always like to do when I, with this language of being a slave to sin is I like to kind of play with some of Jesus' language elsewhere where he talks about, you know, the strong man and binding the strong man in order to take his, to take his goods. And I've always liked the idea to say that uh, if if we sin, we are slaves to sin, and Satan has an ownership in us, so to speak. He has uh, a possession in us, and Jesus has come to bind the strong man. Uh, we see that in Matthew and Mark, and I've just always enjoyed that analogy, that image of Jesus saying, "Hey, I'm here to bind the strong man." You know, uh, uh, he, the Book of Hebrews, chapter two, will say that Jesus will come to take away the power, you know, of him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Um, you know, that this idea of binding Satan by overcoming death, um, it's necessary that we accept the idea that we are slaves to sin, that we are owned by sin in order to be set free by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> well, I think that's a good point. Um, 
And really, kind of what he says, they've always been enslaved. You know, they're not going to catch this, but from our perspective, that statement, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, go all the way back to Adam and Eve. You know, they were still enslaved to sin. And he explains that a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And therefore, if the son makes you free, then you shall be free indeed. Um, a lot of this, what he's saying, they're not going to understand. They didn't understand right at first. But it would yeah. be laying a foundation that their faith would be built upon later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. John, <clears throat> you know, time. something else you got to build on that is, you know, he asked the question, why didn't they understand? And, and, and let me give you a simple answer. Because they didn't want to. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, a lot of it's the, the last few lessons here on Sunday morning, I've been I've been preaching a, a, a short series of lessons on authority. And, and one of the points I've tried to emphasize as I is, is how the authority of Scripture is really uh, or the way authority is established is really no different than the way we communicate in society. And one of the things that I've learned as I'm putting this together, listening to sermons, reading some material and so on, and it's a great point to make is, is, uh, is God wants us to think. You know, I mean, the, the way some of what is written in Scripture, it's designed for us to think about it. But not only that, to use common sense. And I mean, and, and if, if you are fully honest with yourself, and you use true logic and reasoning, you can come up with answers. And, and I think, you know, when Jesus in verse 32, this powerful statement, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. He said, if, if you're willing to honestly put all the facts together, you can come to the right conclusion. And by the way, there's only one conclusion that you will come to if you're honest and you put all these things together and that is i am the christ and so he's making real arguments logical arguments but he 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 wants them to he wants them to think about it you know uh uh i actually uh in john mark chapter 16 there's an interesting illustration here where Jesus is in a boat with his disciples and he says to them in verse number six of Matthew 16, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I'm probably going to stop this. I am. Okay. <clears throat> beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And of course they said, oh, Jesus, we didn't bring bread. And it's interesting that Jesus says, oh, you of little uh, faith, why do you reason among yourself? that you haven't brought bread and he said don't you understand the five loaves and how much was taken up the four or or and uh, the five thousand and the four thousand and then in verse 11 he says how is it that you do not understand that i did not speak to you concerning bread but beware of the leaven of the pharisees and sadducees i want you to notice that jesus after saying that did not say uh how is it that you do not understand that i'm not talking about bread but beware of the teachings of the pharisees he used the word leaven of the pharisees again and then in verse 12 it says then they understood <clears throat> that he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of bread but the doctrine of the pharisees yeah. in other words jesus didn't come right out and plainly say no i'm talking about their influence he wanted them to get it he wanted them to get it and with a good and honest heart, you will get it. Same thing with the parables. Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus explains why he's speaking in parables. And, and that ties into our text. You know, and, and all of John with the religious leaders rejecting Jesus. They rejected him because they didn't want to even consider that he was who he claimed to be. That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and continue forward now, beginning of verse 37. And Tom, if you would, I'll have you read this next section because it's building off of um, this conversation now that's developed about them being Abraham's descendants. And let's read, picking up in verse 37, let's read down through, it's kind of a lengthy reading there on that. <clears throat> 41. 
37 okay, through right. 41, if you would. Okay, uh, verse number 37, uh, John chapter 8. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Okay, jumping back into this top section here. If you notice, my camera looks differently a little bit. My driver broke, and when it reloaded, it bring in the color settings, I guess. So, Tom, coming back to verse 37 there, he acknowledges, of course, that they are Abraham's descendants. But what was it they were wanting to do that automatically nullified, in effect, their connection with Abraham? They wanted to get rid of him. Yeah. I, they wanted I, to kill him. I, they wanted to kill him. I, I, I mean, literally, and that's how far in their corruption and their unwillingness to consider they had gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, and 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 Jesus, uh, he's pointing this out ahead of time. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, why do you seek to kill me? And this this goes in this car. What do you mean we're trying to kill you? You know, yeah. well, you know what? Uh, uh, Jesus doesn't only know what you're saying. He knows your hearts. He knows your corruption. He knows your plottings and so on. And I think he's bringing this out and he's saying it like he's saying this in public. And I'm going to go back to this because this is a mixed audience. I don't think Jesus, I don't, matter of fact, I know that Jesus knows all things. He knows he's not going to reach these corrupt leaders. But there are people listening that will, based on what he says, he will expose them. Mm -hmm. And that will cause some to turn to him. Yeah. There's an interesting connection. I'm trying not to get too far off tangent off this with this tangent. So it's interesting when you look at here, Jesus says to them, but you seek to kill me. Now, this development of them striving to kill him was still in its early phases, okay? Um, by the time you get into Mark, what is it, Mark 2 or Mark 3, they're already conspiring with Herodians and everything. But connect this, though, with going all the way back to Deuteronomy 31, where the Lord tells Moses that his people will not serve him, you know? The Lord already knows, even at that point, that the people will not follow him. They'll go through moments and when they will do okay, but fundamentally they won't. And, and neither situation is creating a have to where they are compelled by the sovereignty of God to do something beyond their will. All right. Jesus isn't forcing them to seek to kill him, but he knows their hearts. He knows all things that will develop and things happen because of what would develop. And I just think it's an interesting point here that even at this point, and if some of them had been a party, to the early developments of how do we do this, they knew immediately that he knew. Um, yeah, and, and, exactly. And I also find it interesting in this text that the way Jesus begins is he makes the point, uh, uh, you, you do what you have seen with your father. Yeah. And he's about to tell them who their father is and they're not going to like it. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, any thoughts, Brian? Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, again, that kill is very interesting um, because back in chapter 7 of John, Jesus in the book of John, as far as it goes, brought it up for the first time. They're kind of surprised. We don't, we, who wants to kill you? Well, they did, but I'm not sure they knew it yet. Um, I think that the, the response in, in John 7, 19 and 20 is probably sincere. Well, what do you mean we want to kill you? Well, you do want to kill me. You want to destroy me. Um, it's not going to be until chapter 12 that we have a, a conspiracy to kill him. Now, We've already had an attempt to kill Jesus. Uh, Jesus' very first message, whenever he's at the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, they take him up and they try to kill him uh, at the end of that time. Here at the, uh, I'm going to spoiler, here at the end of this chapter, they're going to try to kill Jesus again. So it's interesting that uh, 
uh, you know, the the concept of what's going on is that the 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 movement of these things. Jesus knows what's Jesus knows what's at the bottom of all this is the desire to kill him. And I'm not I'm not certain that they even have have made it in their minds. You know, we've got to kill Jesus. You know, yet okay. they will, but uh, it's not entirely clear. The second thing I want to say that's interesting is first of all they say, well, Abraham is our father. Um, I actually think there's very, something very interesting in verse 41 where they say God is our father. Um, that's not a typical Israelite declaration. That's kind of an unusual declaration. For us today, we don't even think about it. Um, but one of the ideas that I've always said is so uh, core to the concept of the covenant of Christ, and this is something Paul brings up in the book of Galatians, is that the covenant of Moses made Israel servants of God. Uh, but it didn't make them children of God. They were children of Israel. Um, but the concept of becoming a child of God is only found in the covenant of Christ. And um, I say what's so remarkable about that, that, that in, in the Old Testament, you have that name Jehovah, you know, what, seven or eight thousand times. You don't, you, you know, the, the times though where God is called a father to Israel, to the Israelites, is very, very, very seldom, um, less than 10 times. And I want to say half of those 10 times are prophetically looking ahead. Um, you, you know, have like God telling Pharaoh, you know, Israel is my son. But beyond that, most of the most of the time, you're talking about God and Israel having a special relationship that's the, of a master and a servant. And the New Testament, of course, we never see the name Jehovah because we see Father. You know, when Jesus says, hey, let me teach you how to pray uh, our Father in heaven. Nobody prayed our Father in heaven in the Old Testament. That's not how you pray. Um, but Jesus is saying, we're going to we're going to have something new. And that's this language of verse 35 that, you know, contrasts nicely with Galatians. I think it's uh, my, my cross-reference says Galatians 4. I didn't look it up. But in Galatians, where Paul is talking about, you know, the difference between a son and a servant, um, the book of Hebrews talking about the better covenant, you know, all of these things are trying to say, look, what Jesus is trying to do is to elevate our relationship with God from that of merely a servant like Moses. You know, that's the Hebrew writer's uh, comparison in Hebrews 3 merely from a servant to being a child of God, to the adoption of grace. That's the big thing that he wants to elevate us to. Um, because uh, as Paul as Paul says in Romans 6, you're either a servant of God or a servant of sin. And here is Jesus saying, you're either a you're either going to be a child of God or a child of Satan. Hmm. And that's, that's really it. And he says, you know, Abraham was a follower of God. And if you were, if you thought of yourself as a son of Abraham by faith, which is an, a neat term itself that Paul uses again, um, the whole point is you you could be a child of God, but you're not. You're not even Abraham's child. <clears throat> That's a good point. All right, good. That you know, I was looking up. I thought David made a reference in the Psalms that Jesus kind of quoted from <clears throat> of sorts that uses the term "sons of God" when uh, he declared himself son of God, and they said you're you're committing blasphemy. And then he says, "But did you know?" It's a bad paraphrase, but I thought he quoted from. You know, I was thinking he says you are God, and he says uh, that it was actually the term that David had used. It was kind of a weird uh, hmm. terminology, um, and I I forgot where it is. It's in John, um, and and uh, it's um, yeah. I, we'll I, I can't think of where it's at. It's embarrassing. We're going to probably run over in the next verse. And I, just, I bet say that's one of those conversations we have that is answered for us within the next four verses that we should have seen from the get go. Yeah. Okay. But I think, it's, I think it's a very valid point, and just kind of reiterate, that under the new covenant of Christ, we were, we are considered children of God by the spirit of adoption, and therefore sons of God, offspring of God, because we've been born again. Whereas the old covenant, they were more the children of, of Abraham, and God's people were supposed to have been God's people. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. With that being said, um, he says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now, I don't want to try to slow this down too much, but I think that's kind of significant. Um, what would be considered as the works of Abraham? And something that they would have clearly understood, I think. Would have been the faith of Abraham. The fact that, you know, his faith was accounted to him for righteousness. And his faith is why Abraham follow the Lord. We see by progression, even in the life of Abraham, his faith grows stronger and stronger, culminating into him, his willingness to, to sacrifice his only son to the father. Um, but they didn't have the faith. They did not listen to the word that was being spoken to them. 
And so he says in verse 40, but now you seek to kill me. He says, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And then he says, leading up, Abraham did not do this. So that's why he says, you're not the sentence of Abraham because of your behavior. If you were truly the sentence of Abraham, your behavior would be that of Abraham's. Instead, you're behaving like your father. <clears throat> and we'll get into that here in just a moment. Um, any questions or comments on that? How about from you folks at home? If you have any thoughts, feel free to share them with us. Let me bring this up real quick. Um, you can drop a comment on the live stream here on Facebook or use the uh, chat room, the chat area on our YouTube live stream. You can also send questions and comments to questions at truthfactorlive.com or email us individually, tom at brian at john at truthfactor.com. As you see there on the screen, we definitely love to hear from you. See what you have to think. And if it's something we can bring into our study, then we will by all means uh, try to do that. <clears throat> okay. So let's continue now with verse 41. We, 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 Tom read it for us. So let's go ahead and discuss it real quick. Um, this kind of triggered, triggered them here, didn't it, Brian? Um, <laughs> let me bring it up here. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father. I'll bet Tom, I'll bet Tom has a thought on this. You know what? Good thought. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Well, I'm sure it's the same thought that you have. Maybe, uh, um, you know, this is an interesting statement here because I, it can be read two different ways based on the life of Jesus. They could just be making the declaration, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus is saying you have another father other than Abraham, and they make the declaration. We were not born of fornication. Uh, we have one father, God. Uh, is are they saying that? in a general sense, defending themselves, saying, no, Abraham is our father, or are they are they appealing to the fact that they don't know who the real father of Jesus is? You know, I've, I've, I've heard people, I've heard people make that observation that, that this is designed to insult Jesus as if they're saying that he's illegitimate. I, maybe... I don't think that's necessary in this context. It could be because they were definitely insulters. As a matter of fact, a little later on, they're going to call him. A, they're going to say he has a demon and he's a Samaritan. So I mean, it it's in line with that type of insults, you know, harshness. But I just wonder which direction to take this. Not that it's going to change anything. So. Interesting. Maybe an underhanded comment about his origin or paternity yeah. if they, from their if perspective. If they were aware of that, you know, yeah. you know, uh, how much was it discussed that Joseph was not the father of Mary? Yeah, or, that's a good question. Excuse me. Joseph was not the father of Jesus. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. How much is that? How much was that discussed? I, well, I don't know. We know for certain I, 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 he wasn't the father of Mary, so we know that for sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, <clears throat> and, and the other thing about that is we do have the conversations yeah. about when Jesus is speaking in Nazareth and they're rejecting him. Yeah. And they say, isn't his brothers, and they, they name his brothers and sisters and mention his sisters and so on. So it, it could be that this wasn't a well-known thing that Jesus was yeah. conceived of the Holy Spirit. Well, being from yes. Bethlehem 30 years earlier, it's possible that they, there wasn't much discussion about it. And if Joseph had already died by this point, you know, yeah, exactly. Know. More than likely Joseph, yeah. well, we know he's out of the picture. Yeah. And so yeah. more than likely Joseph has died by this point. And that's just one of those enigmas that we don't know why, what, when, where, how, anything like that well especially with him being on the cross and he, yeah. he gives responsibility of mary over to john yeah. right yeah 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 mm -hmm. it, it, exactly all, all we can trace him down is to age 12. yeah yeah all right so of course we're, we're, we're speaking we're speaking metaphoric or not metaphorically speaking figurative in the text here when he talks about you do the deeds of your father you know they're claiming abraham is their father they're descended from abraham but their behavior is that of the true father and so by this statement there, they're saying, no, no, God is our father. We have one father and that's God. But beginning in verse 22, um, who just did the reading? Was that Tom? 
Tom read. Okay. So Tom, so then continuing the reading here, Jesus kind of draws a conclusion. You know, if you were truly of your father, if God were your father, then what would they have done? So do you want us to read beginning at verse 42? Oh, did we stop at 41? Yeah, we stopped at verse 41. I thought we read our, I said who just read and you raised your hand. Yeah, I just read. <laughs> okay. I, I read through verse 41. Did you really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. All righty. I'm a little, I'm a little bit cloudy this morning. So Brian, if you would start with verse 42, <laughs> let's read down through verse 47. See if I can wake okay. you up a little bit. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You're of your father, the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Uh, did you say verse uh, 45 or 46? I'm sorry. I was going to have to 47. It's not a good break. Okay. Point, but yeah. Yeah. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Well, then I'll throw you the question <laughs> regarding verse 42 there. He's kind of drawing a simple statement. If God was truly your father, what then would they have done? Yeah, you'd be they would believe him and they would love him and they would listen to him and I mean, he says a couple of things here. He says they would understand him, right. they would abide in him, they would obey him. Um, you know, he, he kind of walks through a few things here. Um, they would want to do what God wants them to do, but he says, you you can't even listen to me. Um, yeah. you, you won't even hear what I'm saying. So. And, and to show how blind these people are, I'm saying, and we're not talking about literally blindness, okay? Ignorant, unwilling to listen to the word. And we, we see this in a miracle and Mark chapter, um, Mark chapter two, um, as well as in Mark and John nine here, they heal someone. He heals someone. They're watching to see if he would heal someone in Mark chapter two, John chapter nine, he heals the man who's been blind. And he, their problem is not, they're not amazed at the fact he healed them. Their problem is he did it on the Sabbath day. You know, if they truly loved if god was truly their father they would have seen the miracle as authenticating he was a prophet sent from god at least that a prophet sent from god but the fact that in both cases and in other cases they were unwilling to acknowledge the very miracle you know to let that be the persuasion the evidence shows that they're they're not from god and he, of course he'll build on that as we go through the section here um, jimmy's got like, a nice comment there oh who's that jimmy oh Oh, there yeah, it is. I thought maybe that's what you were going to say. Let's go ahead and bring that in. That's a, that's a good point. Jimmy says this would be an example of someone with blind faith, correct? And I think what's neat about that is that blindness is a big deal uh, in John. Uh, when John, when Jesus heals the blind man in John chapter 9, um, well, it, it, you, you become aware by the end of the chapter, blindness is a profound allegory for the uh, for the idea of, a, of an intentional ignorance, of a refusal to... Uh, to understand or to appreciate, and Jesus will tell the Pharisees, "Man, if you were blind, you could be healed. But uh, I mean, if you if you were physically blind, you could be healed. Um, but you're going to stay blind spiritually because you refuse. You know, you refuse to be healed. You just won't. You know, and you can't be saved for that reason. Um, they they kind of figure that out by the end of John nine that they're pretty upset by this. But it's a really important idea. And I like what Jimmy said about blind faith. Blind faith has always been offensive to God. I mean, it's, you know, the if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If, if, as it says here, you know, the idea of listening to Jesus, verse 43, I mean, that's a, isn't, isn't John 8, 43, a great parallel to Romans 10, uh, 17, you know, that you listen to my word and that's why you should believe in me. Um, that's, that's the opposite of blind faith. That is knowledgeable, intentional, hearing the word of God and believing it faith. And that's the only yeah. faith that is acceptable to God. Excellent point. Excellent point. All right. Let's see. Tom, do you have any thoughts on that before we go on? No. Covered well. Okay. 
So then in verse 43, he then says, why do you not understand my speech? And he says, because you are not able to listen to my word. So this, where he comes back to his statement, you are of your father, the devil. He says there in verse 44, um, and the desires of your father, you want to do. All right. <clears throat> look in their own life, look at the sin within their life. And ultimately look at what they're going to want to do in regards to Jesus. Um, but he does say, talking about the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Do we want to talk any about what Jesus may be referring to there with that statement? It says he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Well, I've always uh, thought that probably the murder it's talking about is Genesis 3. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of always been my presumption that the yeah. concept is that because Adam and Eve died, I mean, God said the day you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you die. Yeah. Well, they died. I mean, spiritually speaking, they were cut off from God and Satan is accountable, to, uh, you know, and, and let's talk about joint and several accountability for a second. The idea is that Satan is accountable for this, but Adam and Eve are accountable for this too. I mean, it's, uh, it's like if three guys rob a bank, you don't break up accountability by third. They're yeah. all accountable for robbing the bank. That's, that's what God, Jesus is saying here. Satan killed Adam and Eve. He murdered them. Um, and uh, that's kind of his shtick, you know. And how does he do it? By lying. You know, that's his, uh, what's the very first thing he said to them? You won't die. Um, you know, uh, that's a pretty, you know, pretty significant lie. Um, I just saw Jerry's comment regarding verse 41. We can pop back to that here in just a second. Um, you know, so when, when you, you think about, under the new covenant time period, you think about what second Peter chapter two talks about in regards to the deceivers trying to lead others away. I don't know if I remember any new Testament passages that would equate to causing someone to sin being equivalent to murder. Okay. So we, I mean, he does talk about it. if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone was hung about his neck and him thrown into the river. Okay. Emphasizing kind of the wrath of God. Um, when someone causes someone who believes in Jesus to, to, to stumble and to fall. But the fact that he refers to the devil as a murderer, and I, I agree with you. I think that he's talking about the very beginning because their death was a spiritual death, not a physical death. They would later physically die. But they, as in Romans 5 talks about, they were separated from God and that spiritual death there. And he bore responsibility for that as well. Um, yeah, and, and he did it via lying, as we see there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, I, I'm going to uh, uh, Jerry's point, I guess, the, you know, asking about uh, they were they were switching between physical and spiritual meaning of the idea of being born. And uh, that's a good observation, you know, from that yeah. standpoint. Uh, but but also dealing with the uh, 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 dealing with the idea of Satan being a murderer from the beginning. Don't forget that had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would not have died physically. Correct. Therefore, he was responsible for their physical death. Also, you know, yeah. we, we talk about the spiritual death, but you know, you know. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I don't remember the name of the guy, but remember how uh, uh, Russia poisoned somebody that was uh, speaking up against Russia? And I yeah. think it was a slow death. It was a slow death. You know, the poisoning took place, but eventually he died because of the poisoning uh, that was there. And and that's what I see in Satan physically. You know, obviously, I think they died spiritually immediately, or they were separated from God immediately, and they started to die physically. And so Satan was a physical murderer as well as a spiritual murderer. Yeah. And Brian, um, I saw you shared in the chat, and I think this is an excellent verse in regards to what Jesus talks about, the devil being a murderer from the beginning. In 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 8, if you want to read that real quick. Well, and it, it just seems to be a parallel to this, but it uses mm -hmm. different wording. It says, he who sins is of the devil. So that defines what it means for the your your father to be the devil, saying it a little differently. Uh, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. So instead of calling him a murderer from the beginning, he just says he has sinned from the beginning. Um, and then he says, this is the purpose of the Son of God is manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. 
All right, another tangent, not to get too far off on, compare the difference between works of the devil and the works of Abraham. You know, had they done the works of Abraham, they would not have done the works of the devil. Going back to that passage earlier. It's a good point. Good cross-reference there. All right, let's see. <clears throat> Let me check on our time. We have about 14 minutes remaining in our study this morning. So, uh, let's see. For he is a, um, And because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. So, I don't know what's going to be worse for individuals, but... When you have a case in point where someone willingly chooses to believe a lie, when they have the truth right beside them talking to them, all right, it would be like, and this is a terrible example because it seems so trivial, but it would be like holding up something that is blue and trying to tell someone this is actually green and someone standing next to him telling them, no, it's blue. And then willing to choose the one who, and although they know the truth, they choose to believe that it is now called green. Um, and and this, is, this is what they had here. They had the truth right in front of them, but they were choosing to listen to everything that they had heard, things that they wanted to hold to, and therefore then rejecting the very truth that was before them. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me, but they would believe the lies of the devil. <clears throat> yeah, and, yeah, and 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 tied into that, and, and I know mm -hmm. you've been you're alluding to this. They're lying to themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. yeah we could talk about what motivated them, but in the end, they were lying to themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. And then he poses a question. He says, "Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me?" Okay. So, and there's a good question: Are they trying to convict him of sin? You know, if not, then why aren't they listening to what he's saying to them? Yeah, and and, okay. and, and it's kind of interesting because yes, they are trying to convict him of sin. Their definition of sin, yeah. you know, yeah. defining defining what he has done as being sin, rather than being truthful about acknowledging what sin is, and 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 primarily the sin we're dealing with here. Even though you know Jesus can ask the question, you know. What real sin have I ever committed? Because we know the answer to that is none. Mm -hmm. But 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 at this time we're dealing with blasphemy, which which is a legitimate thing. And had Jesus not been telling the truth, what he was doing was would have been blasphemy. I, I, I mean, the credit that he was taking, had he not been telling the truth, it would have been blasphemy. But Jesus, he backed it up. And, and and that's that's the ultimate point. It wasn't just words. Jesus so powerfully backed up that what he claimed was, uh, you know, proved that he was telling the truth and, and he was with and from God. I mean, by the miracles that he performed, he, he was so powerful in that that they had to answer yeah. why he was able to perform miracles. And the answer they give leads to the the quote unquote unpardonable sin yeah <clears throat> that's a good point good point i i think what's neat about what tom's saying we haven't quite read it yet but tom I, I like where tom's going with this because it's a really big deal that their next statement is well you've got a demon that's how that's how we explain all this um they'll say that four times i i hadn't realized before our study today uh they'll say this four times uh you've got a demon you've got a demon now, I like to make the point to say that sometimes in a study with somebody where it becomes a kind of a back and forth, mm -hmm. somebody throws out terms or ideas that are what I call conversation killers. That basically, uh, they're simply an accusation that somebody says, well, I can hold on to this accusation and not let go. And I've, I've said, um, if somebody says you're a legalist, there's a great example. It's not definable. You don't really have a definition. But at that point, anything else I say, they're going to say, well, that's exactly what a legalist would say. Um, you know, they did it to Paul in, the, in Acts uh, 25. You know, Paul, much learning has driven you mad. Well, Paul ends the conversation there because from that point on, anything he says is going to be the kind of thing that a madman would say. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, somebody says you're, you're racist, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck. You're a homophobic. You know, a, a homophobic doesn't mean anything, but uh, these are all words that have a charge to them that, um, well, from this point on, you know, I don't have to listen to you. 
in their case, it's you have a demon. Now, Jesus, of course, you know, exactly what Tom said. You know, Jesus then responds to say, hey, wait a second. You know, I'm doing things that I'm, I'm casting out Satan. You know, this is kind of, I often have said, this is why Jesus casts out demons, is to prove that he that he's doing his works by the work of God. He says that, you know, if I'm casting out demons, you should know the kingdom of God has come. You should know that this is by the power of God because Satan can't stand against Satan. You know, he'll he'll make this case to say that there's a logic here. But in the end, they can grab onto this, he's a demon or he has a demon language because you can then just say, well, and that's why we don't have to believe anything he says, you know. Um, when somebody says, hey, you know, that that Tom preaches, you know, baptism, that's works-based salvation. They don't have to listen to anything else Tom says because they can say, well, anything Tom says comes from a works-based salvation. You know, it's it's something, even I've done it. And I'm not proud of that because, you know, if I wanted to get out of a conversation, I can remember a time or two where I dropped a, uh, uh, a, an indefensible statement, you know, a statement that has no uh, definition. So therefore, it's not really... You know, uh, useful, and I'm not proud of that. Like I said, I look back and think, "Wow, well, you know, I uh, I did that just to get out of a conversation." It's not it's not fair and appropriate. It's you know, it's 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 not a a statement of truth, but it happens every day. Like I said, every yeah. one of our listeners has been in a conversation with somebody where they drop something back. They say, "Well, you know, your Church of Christ, well, you're just a cult." You know, there's one that. What do you say? Anything else I say now, you're going to say, "Well, that's exactly what a cult says." You know, yeah, um, yeah. You, you can't. Yeah, win. yeah. Uh, yeah, Go ahead, guys. I just you sent me off. You know, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry to butt in here, uh, but you know, uh, in in conversations, especially when you're dealing with debate or or discussion of an issue, uh, there are rules of logic and uh, that that factor in. And if if you're going to prove your point, you cannot use what they call a, a logical fallacy, which which is some type of an argument, and there's dozens of logical fallacies, misusing language. What you were talking about, Brian, it, it's called an ad hominem attack, which it, the idea of ad hominem is, is uh, uh, you, you engage in a personal attack. You, you attack the person instead of the, instead of the argument, you attack the person. And, 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 and they're, they're guilty of violating so many rules of logic and so many rules of reasoning uh, uh, another one's a red herring. I mean, uh, w which is the same type of an idea. You know, you you take them away from the subject. You know, and and if you want to know what a red herring is, just listen to a political speech going on now. You can listen to a candidate, and when they're asked a question, <laughs> and it goes a different direction, and, and and that's what they do here. I mean, they're, uh, you know, Jesus is. They're not even considering what Jesus says which is the bottom line and they they don't when you don't have an answer what do you do you attack the character of the one who gave you an answer which is totally irrelevant at, to the truth I, I i mean you know you could be the worst hypocritical person in the world and if you're the argument you're making is true it's the truth the question is are you willing to weigh what's said yeah. in spite of who says it yeah. and jesus that's exactly what jesus is dealing with here and uh, by Jerry the way the, yeah and the perfect and and the perfect father of of uh, logical fallacies is satan yeah. i mean go back to genesis chapter three uh what was his answer to eve god said you shall die and what did he say oh no you're not gonna die you know, you, uh, you know, you te technically, you're not going to die right this moment physically, but you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Jerry, Jerry refers to it as uh, a conversation killer statement is designed to soothe the conscience. Yeah. And, um, and Jimmy kind of agrees, you know, many times people will say you church of Christ are the ones who think you're the only ones making it into heaven. Um, and it's hard to continue with the study from that point because then you got to kind of get them to back up from it. Um, the problem yeah. I have with ad hominems, um, my wife made a dish one time that told her to ad hominems and it wasn't really good. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Hom I, I, hom I, I, hominies I, 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 or whatever yeah. they're called. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Right. Are you talking about hummus? <clears throat> no, no. It was what, what the. No, it's not even it was what hominy. They, yeah, ad hominy. Hominy, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And hominy, it's big old corn swollen and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd have a perfectly good vegetable and they go swell it up, make it taste bad. Yeah, um, exactly. But I think the point's extremely valid. Um, very good points with all that. Now, let's real quick, because we are at the end of our time. Let's uh, one more time. Let's come bring back to our text. So in verse 47, kind of concludes, goes back to his statement about they do the works of their father. He who is of God hears my words. Therefore, you do not hear because you were not of God. That's his basis for his statement. You do the works of your father. And it's clearly not God because you don't hear. They were not hearing the words of Jesus. Okay. Um, and then Danielle, we'll bring hers in real quick here. So I don't yeah. forget it. Um, John 15, 18. If they hate you, no, they hated me first. Jesus says to his disciples. It's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, you know, tie into that last point there. And, and you know, uh, uh, even what Danelle said, you know, in mm -hmm. that situation there. Uh, uh, you've got that. He who's of God hears God's word. Their behavior, and I'm talking about their attitudes mm -hmm. and all those types of things, it's just totally contrary to the way we're supposed to treat each other. And I'm talking about under the old law. I'm talking about the, the, the love. Love your neighbor as yourself. And and ju and just the, the the type of demeanor that we're supposed to have toward each other, compassion. And, uh, you know, uh, go into the Proverbs and, and the proper proper way to deal with one another and so on. They're not doing any of that. Which is why you could easily say, uh, you are not of God. You know, uh, um, uh one final observation here. Brian mentioned the word when we were talking about these attacks, the word cult. You know, mm -hmm. that that's one of the that's one of the harshest charges that can be made. Again, mm -hmm. I, I'm hesitant to use the term uh, even to describe uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And uh, and uh, the reason is, is because that word has been so poisoned as to its meaning there's only one reason you use that word and and it's an inflammatory i mean yeah. you're not wanting to engage in an honest discussion unless you're asking or inquiring about it <clears throat> so so and, and, and yeah. that's exactly the type of language they're using against jesus and jesus is just exposing it that's a good point good point I'd, I'd love right. to throw one last comment, John, if that's okay. Sure. Just to say, mm -hmm. uh, for all of our listeners, true factor moment kind of moment, yeah. um, you're all, you, there always feels like, for me, I always feel like I'm in a conversation. And I think, you know, if I could just think of the right way to say this, this person could understand. Um, and I, and John 8 is a testimony that that's not true, that belief is a choice. It's not, it's not a matter of the right amount of evidence tips the scale every time. It's, it's a testimony that believing is a choice. Jesus has given them everything they need to believe. Uh, they are choosing not to believe. Uh, there's so many conversations where I have where I think, if I could just explain this better, I'm sure this person will believe. But every belief is a choice. you know. Um, and that's such an important thing that comes out of this conversation that Every conversation I have with somebody where I'm just, oh, I, I, why couldn't I convince them? I kind of beat myself up. I just didn't think of the right thing. Yeah. That's not true. Uh, all belief is a choice. You know, if if the thief on the cross can believe from less than seven words spoken by Jesus on the cross in just a few hours, anybody can choose to believe. It's, it's the choice we have. And this is why Jesus says uh, in this conversation, uh, he says it's about people that are of God believing God, meaning people that want to believe in God will accept my word. And that, and that's a profound idea that you have to have a genuine desire to want, uh, you know, to want to believe God. Yeah. And we don't always, we don't always talk about that because it's kind of hard to talk about. It's kind of hard to say, Hey, you have to want to believe to believe. Um, but that's true. You know, you have to want, uh, you have to be, have a virtue. You have to want God. You have to say, I want to believe. And that God will say here, you know, he that is of God hears God's words. He says, you're not of God, so you don't believe me. That speaks to their choice, not not to the the fact that the evidence was insufficient. That's an excellent point. With the bunch of questions I have that I won't ask because we're out of time. But I think it's a very good point. Uh, Jimmy says, choosing to believe equals free will to me. Yeah, 
It's a good point. And choosing not to believe. It's free will as well. Yeah, it's a good point. All right, gentlemen, let's plan to continue this next Thursday when John chapter 8 will pick up with verse 48. 48. Does that sound like a good start point? Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. We really appreciate your presence with us. Appreciate your thoughts and your comments. Feel free to contact us if you would like. Send your email to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Or, and be sure to follow us on our social media links, Facebook, YouTube, even X, uh, formerly known as Twitter. We are Truth Factor Live on all three platforms. We don't make use of X right now very much, but maybe at some point we'll kind of bring that in. Um, in the alphabetical order of things that I need to do, that's in the right location, X. So, all righty. Well, appreciate it, folks. And we'll see everyone back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. Y'all have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. <laughs>